this InspiredInsider.com interview, we talk with Derek Johnson, the founder of the Tango. He talks about the stories anywhere from when he was in his parents' basement cold calling, to a cease and desist, to a mentor who gave him the roadmap for what he was going to do, to some of his major milestones of customers and 100 million text messages that were sent, that and much more coming up now. Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with Derek Johnson. Derek is the founder of Tatango. It's a software as a service provider that helps businesses make money by sending text messages to their customers. I use it, it's great. He started Tatango in 2007 out of his dorm room and has since sent over 400,000 text message campaigns on behalf of their customers. Derek was named by Business Week as one of the top 25 under 25 entrepreneurs in the US. And I always like to include a fun fact, fun fact about Derek. He's very minimalistic and he throws out something every day. And he once got rid of his couch because he realized he wasn't sitting on it that much. Derek, thanks for joining us. Hey buddy, how's it going? <laughs> Love it. Um, Derek, we get a lot of comments from people. They have tons of ideas, they don't know where to start, or they have a current product or service and they're trying to get traction with sales and they're not growing as fast as they want. So you're a great person to talk about going from that idea to making your first sale in dollar and beyond from the dorm room. So tell us, how'd you come up with the idea? Yeah, so I think I'll go back a little further is I've always had a ton of ideas and I. I'm the kind of person that I will get the idea, try to execute on it for two weeks. If it doesn't work, I go on to the next idea. Um, if I would have stopped at idea number five, I would have never got to Tatango. So this idea came after I tried to create an apartment hunting website. Um, and I think before that, I was trying to do some travel website. Like Again, I was just you know mocking up things, and then I'd be like, oh, this is not gonna work, move on to the next idea. How do you know? Yeah. How do you know it's not going to work and to move on? Because some people are like, well, if I just stick it out. How did you know at that point, like the apartment one wasn't going to work and you moved on? Yeah, I think if you jump into the idea, ideas are all great. You know, every single one. It's when you jump into the actual like the financials behind it or the metrics behind it. Apartment hunting. I started looking at kind of you had to have a license and I didn't really want to do that. And then, you know, there was a there was fees associated with it. And then the percentages were very low. So once I did like maybe I'd say four weeks of due diligence and I maybe 10 hours a day of due diligence going to every apartment complex, surveying them, I just realized like, yeah, this is not the business for me. Um, and I think you have to be passionate about it too. Like this, I was passionate about apartments, you know, and finding people good places. But it just wasn't going to make me enough money. It wasn't going to scale. Uh, it wasn't a big enough, you know, kind of objective that I had. Yeah, I asked because someone maybe listening to this right now, and they're like, "I'm not getting the traction I want. Should I move on, or should I keep going with this idea?" So they need to do some of the background research to see first if they have a passion, and two, if it's actually going to be worthwhile, like monetarily. Yeah, and it's hard too because even to tango we pivoted three or four times, you know, since 2007. I think though the key is, is once you commit, that's when you really have to just say, whatever is coming down the pipeline, we're just going to keep pivoting and keep turning and somehow we'll make it. Um, I never committed though to the apartment hunting or the, the travel website. It was more like a, Hey, this is an idea. I want to get to the point where I can commit. And the minute, for me, the minute I took money, um, we raised about 500000 in our in our seed round from half friends and family, half an angel group. That's when it gets, the, for me personally, that's when it gets to the point, like, there is nothing that will stop me. Like, I will never be able to just let this thing fail. That's just not part of my personality. And when you owe that kind of money to people, um, I don't know, I, I always reference it when, Let's say you know I owe you fifty bucks and I I just can't pay you back. Well, that's a big weight on me. Wait till you owe somebody five hundred thousand dollars, and instead of just paying back the five hundred thousand, they want five x nine x their money. That that's a 
a lot of pressure. You know, a lot of pressure. So for me, that's what keeps me going is that there's no way we can fail. So tell me, so how'd you come up with the idea for Tatango, the original? So I think I was on some other business, most likely, kind of working through those steps. Um, Had dinner, I think it was drinks or dinner, with a friend that was in a sorority. And she was, I think, the president of the sorority. And she came to me with a problem. And not for me to solve it, but she was like, we're just having so many problems communicating with our sorority girls, maybe like 80 girls in the sorority. And I was like, well, you know, have you tried, they didn't even have Twitter back then. They had Facebook, I think. I was like, have you tried Facebook? And they're like, nobody checks it enough. Like if we need to change something right away. I was like, well, what about a phone tree? Like, have you created one of those phone trees? And she's like, yeah, but five girls never call. And then everybody doesn't get the message. And I was like, understandable. You know, in fraternities and sororities, they're not the most like reliable people, I would say. Um, and everything that we went through just didn't work for her. So then I was like, well, why don't you text message all the girls? And she was like, actually, that would really work. And I was like, okay, well, you know, can you do it on your phone? And she couldn't do it on her phone. She had obviously, this was 2007, um, and 80 people, even now, you can't really do it on your own phone. So then I went back and I had a Blackberry because I was in business and I had sold my first company. Um, and I tried it on my BlackBerry and I think I could only do nine people. And I was like, okay, if I have a BlackBerry, which back in 2007 was like the primo kind of phone and I can't do it, well, how the heck is anybody gonna do it? So I went online uh, that night and I searched for like, I think maybe four or five hours. And I was like, there's nothing online really that satisfies like 85 people sending one text message to all those people at the same time. Um, there was a few kind of hunky dory programs, but there wasn't really anything that was like the perfect fit. So that night, I remember I got on the phone, called my buddy, uh, Matt Pello, who lived in San Diego State. Uh, he was the president of his fraternity. I was like, Matt, text messaging to all your guys from a computer for announcements and parties and bill reminders and all those kind of things. And he was like, love it. He searched online real quick and Seriously, I think at that point we knew we had a company and we started rolling. I think the next day, um, I I did a little more research that day and then I filed to drop out of school maybe like three days later. Really? So, oh yeah, it was once we knew that there was there was one person that had a need and that one person was a sorority and there was a ton of sororities and that there was nothing really catering to that group. We didn't even know how we would make money, but we were like, this is an awesome idea. So uh, we dropped out of school in Houston. Uh, Matt, he became my partner. He drove He drove up after school ended during the summer. We lived in my uh, one-bedroom apartment. He slept on the ground. I slept on the bed. Um, and we just you know, built out a business plan. We built out a, a mock website. Nobody could tell us that this wouldn't work. We were just 100% gung-ho going for it. And we had no clue about the internet whatsoever. Like, this was 2007, and the shit I know now, like, makes me very, very concerned for where I was <laughs> in 2007. Like, we didn't know anything about cost per acquisition or lifetime value or credit cards or the carrier relations or anything. We, we were just oh, this should work. And I think that's the only reason we actually got to where we were because we were so stupid enough to not know what we didn't know. So so what was it like? Tell me early on trying to get your first customers. Yeah, so uh, we spent about, I would say, six months building out the plan um, for the business, uh, building out the mock-up website and designs. And the, I think we spent a little too much time. We should have done a very, very simplified version like MVP, you know, minimal viable product. Um, so it, it took a little longer. So by that time, we had moved back to Washington State, kind of outside of Seattle, um, into my parents' basement. Um, and I, I was dropped out of school. Matt dropped out of school, too, at that point. And we were down there. Uh, we had a guy in, I think, Brazil or something kind of coding the website for us. Big mistake, obviously. <laughs> Everybody has that mistake. Um, and we seriously would just get, I think Matt, because he was the president of his fraternity, he had a list of all the fraternities and sororities in the United States and their presidents because oh, wow. they had a little group or something. And we would just sit there 
and look them up on Facebook, try to contact them and call them. And we would just sit there with a phone in our basement and it was a small basement, you know, and we would just call, 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 call. And back then it was a free service, so it was a little easier. Um, but yeah, it was just, you know, we sat on, we didn't even have chairs. We sat in like dining room chairs because that was like left over from my parents upstairs, you know. So we just sat down there. I think one of us had a desktop computer, one of us had a laptop from college, and we would just call all day long trying to get one person to use the service. And it sucked because I bet we called 100 people, we got like one. What was something you learned from cold calling, like how you adapted to either get them talking or get them you know, using the service? Yeah, I think because both Matt and I were fraternity brothers um, in different fraternities, I think building a relationship with the person and some kind of uh, some kind of thing that you can relate on before you get in the sales call. If I was just a regular salesperson calling a fraternity member, it would they would just hang up. But I would always start out with like, "Hey, I'm you know Delta Upsilon member from UW, you know, and I see your Sigma, you know, Kappa Pi or whatever. Like, great to meet you. How's your like?" It would just kind of broach that you know subject. So now all of our salespeople use things like Reportive and Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn to figure out who they know in common, if they like right. baseball or soccer or whatever it is, and then where they're located and the weather there. You got to break it somewhere so you're not just a salesperson; you're kind of a friend first. Right, right. That's a good one. Um, so, what was the moment when you obviously you're doing a lot of cold calling? It's it's not easy to do. Um, what's a moment where you hit a big roadblock where you feel like this is this is hard? Yeah, um, and this is the interesting part is I I cannot really remember like a roadblock specifically like one big roadblock. When you're starting a company, and, and I've done everything from landscape construction to all the ones that failed, and I would say like 20 failed in between, and then to Tango, which has been relatively successful so far. Um, every single company, every day, there is something that, in my mind, can put us out of business. And I bet my investors don't like me saying that, and my employees, but um, every single day, it's like, go, I, I love the video on YouTube where the person's running. Um, over those hurdles, and the person hits a hurdle every single time. I've seen that one, yes. Yeah. Just, just keep on hitting it, just keep going. That's really how every startup, now a lot of CEOs won't admit it, you know, that they're hitting these hurdles every single day, but we receive, you know, we've received cease and desist, cease and desist letters from our blog that are pretty serious, you know. We've received, uh, one time, our advertising partner, the revenue went from like $20,000 down to like $75 in one month. Uh, and pretty much destroyed our entire revenue. Um, every single day, there's something that we've had our, our uh, CTO. He pretty much just quit. You know, he was like, "I just don't want to do this anymore," and just left us. Uh, we had India build our website, and when they sent it to us and we sent them the money, it was like broken beyond compare. Every single day in a startup, you know, world or any business, um, you're just going to have roadblock after roadblock. So what I say is, it, it's going to be like a huge roller coaster every single day, like up and down. If you ride that roller coaster, you will kill yourself. Like, I don't doubt you will kill yourself because it's it's emotionally just crazy. What you have to do is you have if it's going like this, you have to kind of go a little bit in, you know, and get excited for the. For the good things, but not super excited because trust me, in two hours there's going to be something that will destroy everything. So if you just go on that roller coaster, you'll have you'll burn yourself out. And I've seen it with past employees. We would go on that roller coaster, everybody in the company, and they would only last like two years until you know complete burnout. It's emotional. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's the emotional roller coaster. And and with startups, you're either very high or very low, and if you fall it. It's not going to be good. So, how do you recover from a CTO quitting? Obviously, someone who's you know big in the company who you need. Yeah. How do you recover from that or move forward? Yeah, you know we used to think, and everybody, all the employees at Tatango used to think this too, that um, everybody was irreplaceable. What we came to realize is that with building systems and hiring the right people, really everybody is replaceable. 
um, even myself, I'm completely replaceable and with a board, you know, and investors, I am replaceable. Um, that means that, you know, you don't get those kind of egos that I think we had the first, you know, one to three years where it's like, oh, well, they would never let me go or I am sales, you know, or I am the engineering department. Now it's, I am a function of the engineering department and a big function of it, but you know, I can be replaced and that's why, you know, I think we get such hustle out of our employees and dedication to their job because, you know, it's not that I'm going to fire them, but it's that they know kind of where their position is and that they're a piece of the puzzle, not right. the entire puzzle. And myself, I would say for the first three years, I thought I was irreplaceable, but I know now that I bet there's people that could replace me that would even do better than I'm doing right now. So you're always replaceable. So how do you, re how do you replace the CTO? Like what did you do at that point? <laughs> um, we you know it's to, easy to say that, but then you have to like do it, and it's like it's it's doable, but it seems like it'd be difficult. Yeah, so we've replaced two CTOs. And again, we've been around for six years. Um, the first CTO uh, was with us maybe three years. Um, he got burnt out. Uh, that was the hardest one to replace because of the fact that we didn't have a lot of money. Um, when you don't have a lot of money, you're looking for a very very specific person. You know, somebody that, you know, has this hustle kind of mentality, maybe just graduated college or is still in college and you can still pay kind of the, the cheaper rates, maybe not even in, you know, a big city. Uh, that one was really hard to replace. And we had a couple people kind of step in as like part time CTOs to kind of handle the engineering, the support tickets while we kind of look for somebody. The last replacement that we did, which was maybe about six months ago. That's when well, we're a profitable company now and you know, we have you know, enough cash in the bank that we looked at and we said, okay, we need to hire somebody that has a ton of experience managing people, managing code base. So we went out and spent a lot of time looking for this person and paid obviously, not a premium, but paid really market rate for what an experienced you know, CTO would be. That one was much easier because there was a lot of candidates for it. Um, and we could choose the best and the price wasn't, wasn't an issue. Right, right. But it's scary because I don't know how to code at all. I barely can turn on my computer. So, and I think that's a big, you know, landscape construction, 100% my first company. I knew how to operate machinery. I knew how to move a rock. Like I, I could do all that stuff, compose invoices and things like that. The internet, it's very scary unless you have an experienced CTO and backup for that. If that CTO goes on vacation, you got to have you know a chief architect, you know, or a developer to make sure that they can handle all the stuff that the CTO can't, you know, when he's gone. So we've finally built that up now so that everybody everybody is replaceable and people can take vacations. So what you do with the company um, around your first sales when you first started generating revenue? Um, what did you do as far as, I know you were talking about transitioning to, to business clients. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah. So first, I think three years or so, uh, we were all focused on groups and organizations. That was key. Like, you know, and I think the first year and a half, what we did is we placed ads at the bottom of every text message, uh, and somebody would pay us for those ads. Uh, we were making maybe 20,000 bucks a month. Then we found out that that company that was placing those ads, they were all house ads, which mean they were just kind of like fake ads and they were paying us for fake ads. So one month we we're doing 20,000, the next month they told us and said, hey, we don't have any more house ads. Our revenue went down to like $75. That was a huge, that, that was the worst experience ever because, and we had just raised I think 500,000 at that point, maybe the month before based on the fact that we we're the more messages we sent, the more ads we could place, and we were right. getting a certain CPM, I really felt that I lied to every single investor that I pitched because that whole business model was completely fucked. We we were screwed. We had no business model, and we had just taken all their money. So I and I think I I think I emailed everybody, and told them, and said like, hey, if you want your money back, I understand. But I think most people, what you'll realize in startup land. Uh, they invest in the entrepreneur, not the idea. Mm. Maybe a little bit the idea because they know that the entrepreneur is going to have to shift that idea 50 different times. Um, is that really though it wasn't a business plan but it was just you were relying on one client? Like, like how do you know the difference there? 
so it was the business plan. Now we had one advertising server, uh, which was the person that was giving us all these. The eventual business plan was that we were going to build our own server so that people could come to our website and advertise within fraternity or sorority text messages or church text messages or groups and organizations, right. sports teams. Um, but I think we came to the realization that if they couldn't make it work in this company, I raised like $40 million dollars guys in their basement like us most likely couldn't make it work and and we looked at our money and we looked at you know our runway and that we'd have to build this advertising platform right away it just, um that point we were we sunk down from like 20,000 a month down to like 1,000 a month in revenue uh we had maybe five or six employees at that time i think we laid off a couple um and we looked at the the trajection of I think we we're I think at that point we started charging like four dollars and ninety nine cents to use our service for fraternity or sorority. After like six months or so, we looked at the the growth line, and it was embarrassing. It was like we were going up by like six hundred dollars a month or something uh, in revenue. And I looked at the five hundred thousand we raised, and I said, this is just not a company that will be worth what our investors want it to be worth. So at that point, we just said, look, let's just keep Tango running and minimal support. You know, we'll support the clients we have and any new buddy that wants to sign up, they can sign up, but we're not going to focus on it. And we pretty much took the five or six employees, I think, that were left after, you know, we laid off a few. Um, I think we laid off an engineer because we just didn't need him anymore. And we said, look, social media is really hot right now. Let's do kind of Vayner Media thing. And just create an agency really quick. I think we called it Derek Media, just to kind of fuck with Gary a little bit. Um, everybody, that was the worst decision I ever made because everybody made fun of me all the time for calling it Derek Media. But it was the easiest thing that we could figure out. And we seriously, within like two hours, we had that company set up and we had started doing consulting. We were charging 150 bucks an hour to just consult on Facebook and Twitter. And this was 2009, 2010, so it was like really hot back then. What we realized was, you know, businesses need a lot of help, especially small to medium sized businesses. But we realized is Facebook and Twitter, they were really great and we were presenting them with like graphs of their likes and their tweets and their retweets. And after about six months, we realized we were we were not screwing our clients, but we were kind of we were showing vanity metrics to prove to them our invoices. It wasn't giving them like a bottom line figure. Exactly. It looked good, but Exactly. It was that, hard. It's also in social media it's hard to sometimes equate you have that like to like a dollar amount that that small business wants. Exactly. And what we found was that and we always say this at our company, um, everybody kept asking us, "Great, you guys have a million likes or 100,000 likes or whatever. How many butts in the seat is that is that going to bring me?" And we could never let them, we can never tell them, especially in a small to medium sized business, you don't have the analytics and the tracking that are needed for kind of like Coke can obviously figure out their sentiment and value and things like that. We just didn't have it. So after like six months and then nine months, all of our, all of our uh, contracts were getting canceled and we were doing a great job getting likes and tweets and all, but it never equated to butts in the seats. Well, it may so, have, but you can't like really put a exact figure on it. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure it was, but you couldn't track it. And if they can't right. track it, they're not that interested. Right. Um, it's very hard to sell them. And then all you know, the newspaper, the radio show, the television, they're all saying the same stuff. And they said it most likely better than us. So you know, they were taking all the attribution of those you know, butts in the seats. So at that point, we had one client and he was canceling. It was maybe a $3,000 a month contract with him, kind of a retainer thing, a restaurant. And... I think to save him, I was like, give us like three more months and we're going to try sending text messages to your customers because that's the new thing. And we were completely lying at that point. We, we did not know. We were like, we're just trying to save this guy coming up with something new. And maybe this was the fifth time we'd come up with something new to keep his business. So we started having customers of his opt in. Uh, so they would text like pizza to 33733. And when they did that, their phone number would be stored in the Tango database. Again, we built it for fraternities and sororities, but it worked for businesses. And then every week, he would send out a message saying, like, hey, come in for 20% off your pizza. And, you know, people would come in. And he would be able to see 
you know, the people actually coming in, showing the text message and the butts in the seats. And I think this guy, we put him on a plan. I put, think we put him on the $4.99 plan. And I think you can have up to like 100 subscribers, but we never had a plan even above that because nobody would go above 100 people. And he went up to like two or 3,000 people and was paying us like $500 a month just for the text messaging. At that point, we were like, oh shit, we have the right product. We have the right website and the right name and everything. It's just we're not catering to the right crowd. So we immediately switched gears, shut down Derek Media, and I think we laid off a couple people that were Derek Media people, um, found them jobs at other agencies because you know they were really in, like the social media side. They didn't want to go back to text messaging. Um, maybe we got our team down to like three people at that point, and we started you know advertising that our business is for small businesses to send text message to your customers and, and drive revenue. Yeah. And that's when it started kind of, you know, growing. Yeah. So what is what is um, something you did to try and make money that you thought would work but just failed miserably? Yeah. Um, I think one of the one of the biggest examples is we listen to our customers too much. Uh, we kind of take the thirty seven signals approach where, yes, if we hear ninety nine out of a hundred customers say something that they want, we're going to listen to them. But what we did back in the day was every single customer would pretty much have the same voice. So customers would ask for things like voice calling. So they'd be like, oh, I want to text message people, but then I want to send them a voice message or call them. So we were like, oh, yeah, we'll do that too. And we spent months on that thing. And what happened was it diluted the brand because once we launched voice calling, and I think we had a social media integration, we had text messaging. When I asked you and I said, hey, what does Tatango do, you would look at me and go, well, they're kind of like, they wouldn't know. They, they would have to kind of like come up with like a hybrid or they would just say one piece of what we were doing. So at that point we said, screw it. All we do right now and really forever at this point is text message marketing. We send mass text messages. You know it, everybody else knows it now. When they see Tatango, that's what they think. It's very easy to tell your friends, your family, but back in the day, it was very, very hard to tell anybody kind of what we did or at least get them to remember what we did. Yeah. So, so it's calling cost. We thought it'd be the next biggest thing. And I think that's a big thing for entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs, true entrepreneurs, are the guys and girls that are coming up with ideas every single day. I can come up with 15 awesome things that I can add to Tatango every single day. But really, all I do is file them away because it would destroy our product. And that's the hardest thing to do. Or even other companies, people approach me all the time to invest or advise or like, you know, take over this project for them. And I'm just like, I have to stay focused. Yeah. It's hard. I, it's hard to stay focused. Once I do it, I have to stay focused. So how do you do that? How do you stay focused? How do you, maybe someone approaches you that you respect, that you like, and you think it may turn into something and you say no, or you know this, this other feature you could add could be amazing, but you say no. How do you do that? Do you have a system for that or just? I, I think it's that it's ingrained in our company that we listen to the 99% and we listen and when we do something it is for the 99% and everything else just kind of gets filed away. And you look, you go to any one of our competitors websites, it is a joke. Uh, they're, you log into their website and try to send a message, it takes eight clicks. Ours takes two. Uh, my mom, I remember when we were doing kind of fraternity stuff, I said, you know, add yourself to a list, your phone number, and send yourself a text message. She used one of our competitors. She could not do it after 36 minutes. And I would just keep, I'd be like, no, 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 keep trying, like, keep trying to figure out, could not do it. Our service, like, if you really can't use it, most likely I don't want you on our service. Like, you know, it's that easy to use. Nice. So what was, okay, that's something that failed. What's something that you, that's really worked that you're a little surprised about to this day? You know, uh, surprising would be, I think the videos that we have. Um, we, gosh, what was it? And this is just kind of that hustle mentality. Uh, I think we saw a Rand Fishkin from SEO Moz and we were like, those are cool videos. And trust me, nothing anybody does is ever original. And I emailed Rand and I was like, hey, 
can I use the concept and call it like the Tango Fridays or whatever, his whiteboard Fridays. He was like, yeah, sure, no problem. Um, again, we're not competing or anything. And we, we didn't have any studio or anything like that, so we got a flip camera and we didn't even have a whiteboard. Now we have a whiteboard and all kinds of shit. So um, we went to University of Washington and what we would do is we would set up in a classroom and it had to be light out too because the light, we didn't have lights, so it had to have light coming out from the outside, but this was during school. So what we would have to do is we would wait till the bell rang, we would quickly search all the classrooms, find a classroom that was available we would film like three videos, and these videos are like three to four minutes. Me just talking about one. I've seen a bunch of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're yeah, good. Yeah. They're educational. If if you're into SMS marketing, right. you're interested. My mom thinks they're boring as hell. But uh, <laughs> we just we seriously sat it up, drew the little square so we knew where the the space was on the on the whiteboard. And Alex would stand behind, click play. I would I would uh, you know write up on the board, talk about stuff. Half the time. The bell would ring, and then a class would be walking in. We'd be like, "Shit!" And we had to go to another classroom <laughs> to film it. But those things are amazing. Like people, I'll answer the phone sometimes, like for support or maybe sales when you know lunchtime when people aren't here, and people will be like, "Whoa, is this the guy in the video?" And I'm like, "Yeah, like how's it going?" And they're just blown away that I'm even talking to them because I think with those videos, they feel they have some kind of like relationship already built with me. Right. Um, so videos are huge, and that comes back to kind of being like the brand expert in your industry. Um, that's key. So, Derek, what's one of the pivotal connections you've made uh, in this journey that's helped you? Pivotal. Um, I think it's been the evolution that we keep going up the food chain in terms of who our clients are. Mm -hmm. You know, started off as a free model. Not even freemium; it was just free, it, you know, ad supported. Um, now that I think back, I'm like, Jesus. Uh, we started out free, then we went to 4.99, which was like the small groups and organizations. Again, very, very little budget. 4.99 was like pulling teeth to get it out of that. Four dollars and ninety nine cents. Four, yeah, four dollars yeah. and ninety nine cents. Um, and that was groups and organizations. They never had credit cards. It was a pain in the ass. Then we went to, and what was hard is they couldn't measure. They couldn't like you getting all your people to show up for a fraternity party, what's the value? Is that worth $4.99? It's very hard to put a value to that. So then we moved to small businesses. Easier to put a value to, the problem with small businesses, they don't have a budget. Uh, there's a ton of studies online, Constant Contact did a recent study I think a year ago, and the average small business, I think under 10 or 25 employees, spends $500 a month on marketing and advertising. If you take, let's say you have to have email marketing, obviously, because that's kind of the staple of most things, you know, 49 bucks, you've pretty much eaten up your entire marketing budget for the entire year. So where are you going to find the money to pay $49 for Tatango? And then on top of that, you would have to find the money to advertise your text messaging campaign. So you wouldn't have money for radio or television or even print stuff at Kinko's to have it. It was very, very hard. So we had found, at that point, we had found a segment, which is businesses that could get results from text message marketing, but they didn't have a big enough budget. And also, if you get 100 people in your SMS campaign and you have a 5% redemption rate, that's only five people. You know, it's not very sexy numbers. Uh, it's not like the group on where you get 20,000. Now we have campaigns that are 250,000, 500,000 people. You get a 5% redemption rate. It's amazing. Your doors are being busted down. Right. So uh, recently, maybe six, maybe 12 months ago, uh, we started shifting more to what we call mid market. We sell to enterprise, but it's not enterprise sales. Um, now our subscriptions are $499 up to about $10,000 a month. They come with a little more support, um, same product, but just a different way we're positioning it. And I think we offer way more support and uh, certain features that the mid market to enterprise needed. And now it's ridiculous. We're getting clients, um, one of our clients, a tanning salon, launched their campaign. First 30 days, they generated $200,000 in new sales. And this is sales that people actually came in, showed the text message to the cashier. So it's easy to track. It's right. not like a like on Facebook. So how do you, from a mindset perspective, shift from, I mean, you raise your price a hundred times over the course. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, Some people, I mean, I know like as an entrepreneur and a founder, you're like agonizing. You want all the customers to stay and yep. you don't want to upset so anyone. You have to grandfather. Yeah, you know, yeah. I think that's key. What you have to realize is if if you are shifting between different, you know, segments of like say businesses from small to medium to large or enterprise, you're not gonna get a small business to pay a medium sized business price. A lot of businesses make that mistake in software as a service. They say, Oh, we're now going after mid market and all those small businesses have to pay mid market prices. There's no way that a, a small business could afford mid market prices if their average budget is five hundred dollars. So it's just impossible. So you have to grandfather those people in and say, look, thank you for staying with us. Continue to use the product at the old price. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's a little it's a little nerve wracking, especially because the product doesn't change too much. It's more kind of the positioning that you're putting towards the product and the services. Same login screen, same sign up, but now we're charging obviously 10x more. It's just we've realized that the value if somebody's making two hundred thousand dollars, you know, a month in new sales. We can charge you know fifteen hundred bucks, and that that's a really good deal. Right. So tell me about um, when you met Ryan Ellis and what happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Ryan, he's the former CEO of Eye Contact. Um, we maybe three six months ago or six months before we met him, we were, we were really on a kick, and we really really realized how listening to other people that had done it before and maybe were a little bit ahead of us. And Ryan was way ahead of us, um, had done it and listening to them because they, a lot of the issues we experienced in the first three years could have been resolved if Derek from the future just came back and said, hey, do X, Y, and Z and you can avoid all this shit. Right. Uh, like building a website in India. You know, That's what not, you're doing for people right now with this video. Like you, yeah. Derek, are going to these. <laughs> and I'm the kind of, like email me, my, it's D-E-R-E-K at detango.com. If you're. If you're running a software as a service business or landscape construction way back in the day, uh, let me know because I can help you avoid a lot of these issues. So Ryan, um, Alice, former CEO of Eye Contact, he grew his company like $50 million in revenue, but he started out where we were. He was on the same trajectory. You know, I've read his book before. It's very good. Um, he called us. I think his assistant called us and said, hey, Ryan's in town and would love to meet you. And I've been kind of pestering for him a while, and we had a lot of mutual friends. So um, I go, yeah, yeah, sure, let's let's meet up. This is awesome. Where is he at? So she sent me the address, and it was in San Francisco. And I was supposed to meet him tomorrow in San Francisco. And the woman thought I was. I think Ryan did too. Thought I was in San Francisco. I didn't say anything. We looked online, couldn't find any tickets. There was nothing available. Like it was very. Maybe we had like. 15, 16 and you're in hours. Seattle at the time? Or? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Seattle. So looked at my buddy. Uh, at this point, we were kind of operating out of my uh, my apartment. and It was a big apartment, so we had my employees there. And then my buddy, he was kind of freelancing WordPress stuff. And I looked at him. I was like, hey, road trip? And he was like, sure. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, when you want to do it. I was like, we have to leave now. So we seriously jumped in the car, threw some clothes in the car, drove all the way to San Francisco all night. Pretty much, I drove, you drove, and we kind of switched off. Meeting was at 9 a.m., spent maybe two hours with Ryan. Um, he pretty much built out a roadmap for the next two years of our company, uh, pretty much to where we're at right now. And obviously, we stay in touch, so he's built it out even further. Um, and avoided, I would say, millions of dollars in mistakes. You know, And accelerate. the minute we started listening to him and listening to other people is when we started doubling our revenues every year, or more than doubling, actually tripling. That's when you know, things started to click because those roadblocks weren't as frequent you know, and not as devastating as they used to be. Because Ryan knew everything. He, he was like, you know, here's what you're going to experience. Here's where you should go. Oh, and then also he was right too because he said when you get to a certain point in the small business market, you're going to want to start offering a more mid-market enterprise solution. You know, he was completely right there. And, you know, when we got to that point and we realized it too, I emailed him. I was like, shit, you were right like a year ago, you know? <laughs> and that's the problem is your parents. He's people, like the oracle. I know. They're, they're always right. And it, it's frustrating as hell. But now nothing's new. Like uh, Rand Fishkin with the Whiteboard Fridays, it works for him, obviously. He does it every Friday. 
if it works for him, I'm pretty sure it will work for every other software and service company. Ryan, he was selling email marketing. There's no difference except for that it's email compared to text messaging. Different medium, yeah, but yeah, same now, thing. I, I think I would have a much harder uh, time listening to advice from somebody maybe like from Path or Facebook where it's a completely different business model. But if you're doing software as a service, it doesn't matter if you're doing Quicken type stuff like invoicing or text messaging or a dating app you know, that charges. It's all the same, cost per acquisition, lifetime value. He broke that all down, and once we learned that, you know, we were off to the races. So, what was one thing that he said that you still rem- you think back on? It, it wasn't even one thing. It was, it was just every. It was. He's actually written a. You can link up to it. I think it's like the Startup Guide or something. A dot com. Pretty much everything that he's written in this kind of book and guide that he has now, we touched on. Um, really, what his philosophy was, in which. I've learned now in software as a service is you have a cost per acquisition. You know, you can pay $500 per customer if you're making $1,500 over the lifetime value. You just got to find the cash flow to support that. And then you scale it. That, that's how big businesses do it. That's how Salesforce, you know, every exact target, they're all working on a cost per acquisition and lifetime value. And every single metric that we measure at Tango is now based on those two metrics. Right. Uh, and that's what everybody cares about. And that's when you, when we get acquisition offers, yeah, they like hearing the history and the product and the team, but it's like, it really comes down to like, how much can you acquire a customer for and what's the lifetime value? And from us, as we move towards the enterprise and mid-market, it's getting a little more sexy because the lifetime value is $20,000 plus compared to $599. Right. So what are some of the, Derek, what are some of the big milestones you, you've been able to achieve? <sighs> Yeah, we don't look at them as like big milestones that we've achieved. I think just little like blips on the the kind of milestone, you know, roadmap. Um, big milestone is obviously raising capital, but that is, I look at it as, as a negative. You just gave away a shitload of your company. You know, it's not like, ooh, we raised capital, now we celebrated. The minute we raised capital, we were like, fuck, now we have to actually produce something and we're liable for it. And we have a board of directors now, it's not a it's not a positive. You know, you have to do it because it's a necessity. I mean, we raised even at five hundred thousand dollars, we raised way too much money, in my opinion. Because at that point, we didn't know our cost per acquisition and lifetime value. We were just kind of throwing money at, at anything to see if it worked. Um, so that's been big. When we moved out of my parents' uh, basement into a real office, that was really cool. Again, when I talk about real office, it was like twelve hundred bucks a month. Like we're not talking class A office space here. Again, even that was not a positive moment. It was just a shift in our business. Uh, now we had a 12-month lease, and we were spending money on office when my parents were giving it to us for free. Um, that was big. The shift from uh, groups and organizations to businesses, and then I think a big, big shift in just our mindset at our company and our product has been shift from small businesses to mid-market. Uh, that that was pretty big for us. Mm-hmm. Um, those have, those have been the kind of biggest ones. Um, and then hiring, I think, in each division, as we get more money, as we get more experience, hiring the people that have experience. So we recently hired you know, our, our CTO, um, you know, came in with experience and redid everything. You know, our process, our team, everything. We recently hired a CFO. He redid everything and put in a process. And you know, we recently hired bookkeepers. So every division kind of has its own milestones too. Yeah, I mean, I just remember uh, reading on your site that in 2011 you sent like a hundred million text messages or something yeah. like that. That's, and I think, and what was funny is I think back then that was when we were kind of on that advertising model, and it, again, it's a vanity metric. You know, it it was making us no money to send these messages because we can have this advertising. So, you know, we look at it right now. Our only metric that we really gauge on is MRR, monthly recurring revenue. And that's what we base everything on, how much we lose, how much we gain, and how much expansion per month we have. Right. Um, that's the key. So what's the one thing that you'd recommend the audience to do right now if they want to either get their first sale or go beyond to get traction? Yeah, I think there's a couple. One is if you don't have the product yet or don't have something, just do it. Like I, There's a ton of people that I know out there that have amazing ideas. And it will be an idea for two or three years. 
the difference I think between a true entrepreneur and you know a non-entrepreneur or wannabe as I call them is that the true entrepreneurs will just take something, try it, even at an MVP state. And I, I've spent a couple thousand dollars on some specific ideas and they haven't worked out. So you can spend different varying amounts of money, but you just have to do it like that. You just have to get it done and actually try something and see if it works. Once you do have it, um, you know you have to pound the pavement. It was not fun pounding the pavement. It's, it's I don't pound the pavement anymore. I do some of the enterprise sales, but most of my sales guys do all that stuff now. Um, but back in the day, I would be in the basement by myself. Usually, my partner would go home at like five or six or whatever, and I would just. They lived on the lake. This was the most. This was the worst part. My parents lived on the lake. We had an awesome boat. We had my, we had friends, and my sister had friends over, and there's always people at this house. And I was in the basement, and it was hot as fuck because it's obviously the summer. And I would just be with a list, cold calling fraternities and sororities all day. And I think during the summer, I went out and I stepped foot on the dock once. And I'm not joking. Like I was in that basement just cold calling left and right. And I think that was when we raised our the first 100000 of the 500000 our friends and family. That's the worst money you can raise. Um, angel investors, they realize that most likely you're going to lose money for them, you know, and there's going to be a couple big wins in there. Friends and family are the kind of people that you see all the time. Now they know that most likely they're going to lose their money, but losing friends and family money is way, way worse than losing angel investor money. So that was horrible during that time. Yeah. What's um, some of the tools or systems you use or software in your business, obviously besides Tatango? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we used to build a lot of the stuff in house. We'd be like, "Oh, we need a billing system. We'll build it." Or we need a CRM system. We'll build it. Um, and that's why I had so many engineers back in the day and weren't profitable. Uh, now, and I think that's 2007. There weren't very many kind of you know outsourced kind of platforms that you can use and, and APIs that you can connect. Now, the only thing that we actually bring to the table is the Tango is the interface and the message sending capabilities which connect to somebody else. You know, the tier one aggregator. So everything else we pay for and somebody else manages, which is the way it should be. So we have people that file our payroll, ADP. We have, you know, Chargeify who does our billing system. So, you know, they do all the dunning and the credit cards and the subscription churns and all that kind of stuff. Um, we use Salesforce. That's a big one. That was a big investment kind of for our sales team and our account management team. Um, we use Snap Engage. We love Snap Engage. Uh, it pops up on the website. It's like, hey, can I help you? Awesome. People love chatting with people. Uh, we yeah, that is a great feature. I love that feature. It's it's crazy. And it's funny because my mom uses it as a way to just get a hold of me, which is kind of weird. <laughs> She'll like, talk to one of our sales guys and be like, hey, is Derek in the office? I'm like, mom, you could call or text me. Like, But she loves just going into Tango and somebody it's will pop easy. up. Yeah. It's easy. Right yeah. So it's kind of funny. Um, and we use HipChat. Uh, HipChat. Uh, dot com uh, for inner office communication. We have kind of a remote team now. We have uh, two or three people in the office and then two people, one in New York, one in kind of Bellevue-ish area. Um, so that kind of keeps everybody together. We use I Done This um, to kind of keep everybody in the loop on what's going on from a development standpoint. We use Assembla um, to organize all our sprints and our tickets. Um, we use Zendesk for support. Uh, we use Ring Central for our phone systems. Even our office, we use Regis. I don't know if you've ever heard mm -hmm. of them. Yes. It's where lawyers, pretty much, if you're a single lawyer, you just get an office. Um, we just keep getting more offices and we get more employees, and it comes with a secretary and they clean the office. And we try to get it down to the point where we have to focus 100% on text messaging. Now, th that's something I've done with my life, too, that I, if I really want to focus on Tatango, and I think. If you're an entrepreneur and you raise money, you have to be 100% focused on whatever you're doing. That means that doing the laundry, cleaning your house, going, cooking food, you know, all those things that distract you from doing more blog posts, you know, or doing more videos or interfacing with your team need to be outsourced. So I pay myself enough that I can afford, you know, I think you saw somebody earlier, you know, going through the fridge. We have food delivered every day to our office. You know, we have... 
I have dry cleaning service that comes, picks up my stuff. I have a cleaner that comes almost every single week now. And I don't even need it. She just comes and cleans everything. And I don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. So I can focus being in front of a computer doing deals. Um, I think that's key. So once you get enough money, uh, again, the first three to five, three to four years, didn't have that kind of money. I couldn't pay myself that kind of money to afford these kind of things. Once you do have that kind of money, start outsourcing. We just hired a bookkeeper because I don't want to be doing bookkeeping. That's a waste of my talents. Um, outsource everything. Yeah. No, I love that. Thanks for that. That's very, very helpful. And I have one last question for you, Derek. But before I ask it, I want you to tell us a little bit more about Tatango. What's exciting as of late? Yeah. Um, we've been really focused on getting SMS. SMS is kind of like email, at least the last couple of years. It's just send a mass text message and see what happens. Uh, it's, it's more of like, hey, how big your list is? Vanity metrics. You know, send a list to 100,000 people. You're doing a really good job. We're really trying to step back and say, okay, if you're sending to 100,000, what's your churn rate on each message? What affects that churn rate? Let's try to interface with the point of sale system so we can track not only redemption rates are great, 5%, but how many people, how much revenue are you generating? And then how much profit are you generating from that? So we're building a lot of systems in place that are going to allow us to really dive deep into that. The eventual goal is that when somebody gets a new uh, mobile phone number in their database, we'll be able to tell them right away, this phone number will be worth $10 over the next six months or $20 over the next 12 months or the lifetime value of that. The same shit Ryan told us you know, from a SaaS standpoint, software as a service, cost per acquisition, lifetime value, they should have that in text messaging. They should have that in email. And the big guys, Amazon, eBay, you know, retail stores, they're doing that with email. But the mid sized companies, 35 locations, couple thousand employees, it's still kind of like, hey, we have a big list. We send you know, emails and text messages to it. We're trying to take it and look at it from a very scientific standpoint and add the features you know, that will allow us to do that. So, but from that, you know, we're not adding a ton of features. We're focused on optimization. To be honest, I try to look at our product every day and say, okay, what can we remove? You know, what is excessive on this? Even like a couch. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like I looked at my couch and I, and I, I can't believe you even said that, but like I looked at my couch and I was like, I'm not really sitting on this that much. And it's just kind of wasting space and the cleaner's got to clean it. And it's like, it's just sitting there and then I have to move it every time I move. I was like, screw it. Just get rid of it. And if you can look at it the same way for your product, right. you're gonna. Most products get feature overload, you know, and then it's very hard to pull them away from customers. You know, we really try to pull features away from customers, and when customers complain, you know, we just say, "Look, it's for the better of your business because we're looking at your bottom line. You know, it's going to save you more time, and you don't need to do this feature." And that's the crazy thing. If you give them a feature, we learn this very quickly. If you give them a feature and they did not want that feature and they do not need that feature and it won't help them in their business, they 100% will use that feature. And it'll just it'll, it'll worsen their profit margin because now they're doing something that doesn't make any sense just because it's a cool feature. Right. You see that like in email marketing, people will put, oh, you let them put images in their email? Now they put 400 images in one email. And it's like, oh my God, like why did I even allow them to do that? You know, Because it really didn't help them. So where can people find out more? What's the uh, the website? Yeah, we have a ton. Uh, Tatango.com, that's where you can find out like if you want to buy. Uh, Tatango.com forward slash blog. We blog once a day, five times a week. And most of the time, that's me. Like I'm spending at least an hour and a half a day blogging. Um, it's not something you can outsource. We've tried to do that. It's not something you can bullshit. You have to be on it. And you have to be an expert. Um, maybe you can hire somebody once you get a certain size and you can train somebody and they can become an expert and learn from you. But at a company of five employees, we don't have the money to hire a professional writer that is going to know our business the way I know our business and comment and critique on things. Mm -hmm. um, become the expert. That's key. Like if I can get anything from this is if you're going to do, you know, a fresh books competitor, become an invoicing expert. You know, if you're going to become a text message marketing guy, know everything about text message. I know everything about text messaging. If anybody tried to ever compete with me, I'd destroy them. I know I know when, you know, the text message created, why it's 160 characters, the laws, the the federal laws, the carrier laws. 
most other people, they just, they don't know that kind of stuff. So they're not regarded as an expert. So blogs are key and, and you'll see on our blog, we put a lot of time and effort into it. Plus the SEO value is just ridiculous. Um, we're posting content every day where our competitors are posting shit every week. So there's a big difference in that. Huge. Um, and it educates your users. Uh, Twitter, uh, to tango obviously, forward slash the Derek, D-E-R-E-K Johnson. Uh, Derek Johnson was taken. Uh, Facebook, just look me up, Derek Johnson. I'm pretty accessible. You can even call me if you want or text me. My or phone. they can, you know, live chat you. They can live chat me. I'm r rarely on the live chat, but you can ask for me. Uh, usually they do a little screening nowadays because people just want to just chat and see if I'm actually there. Uh, call me if, if you text me 206-334-4012. That's, that's my cell phone right here. Um, you know, whatever way you want to get a hold of me. I owe everybody else because Ryan and other ton of yeah. software. That's very generous of you. Yeah, they've helped me before, and I'm not going to help Ryan and them because they're way ahead of me. I have to give it, you know, back to somebody else. So if you have a software as a service company, let me know, and I can help you save a ton of headaches. <laughs> so, Derek, my last question for you is: obviously, you're very close with your family. So what did your parents say when, after three days, you just quit school? You know, because I from day from third grade, I was I was not suspended, but I was like uh, threatened to be suspended from school from selling stuff in school. I guess you can't sell stuff on school campus, especially candy to kids that just get jacked up during the day. Um, I've always been selling stuff, always been hustling. Horrible grades. I suck at school, um, and I and I I've offset that by working and then hiring tutors, you know, with my own money to try to offset my grades. But still, I'd get C's and D's and it just, I was not happy at school. On the, on the partying and the friend side, that was fun. I partied way too much and had too much fun in, in college and high school. But on the academic side, never got it, never excelled. And I think I'm a smart person, but it would never allow me to excel with the way they taught or with the way they did test and things of that nature. So, um, yeah, they, it was funny because they did not argue one bit or they, they were just like, okay, we'll, we'll see you in a little bit. And like, I just quit school. Um, they were paying for school. So maybe that helped a little bit. They're like, <laughs> oh, that um, and I think one of the things you have to realize if you're in school right now, or if you have a job or whatever, and you're looking at going to do an entrepreneurial kind of venture, ask yourself, what is the worst thing that could happen? This is the most, like I speak, at, I used to speak a lot of colleges and high schools. I've kind of cut it out now in bigger crowds I'm okay with, but just to optimize my time or do video interviews like this because you can reach way more people. I always used to, people would always ask like, hey, should I quit school? And I would say, what is the worst thing that can happen? And what's crazy is our company, you know, with all the customers we have, the employees, if our company completely imploded, the worst thing that would happen is I would go back and finish senior year of college. And even for me, my parents were paying for it. So when people ask me that in college and they're a senior in college, I go, the worst thing that would happen to me is becoming you. <laughs> like that doesn't sound so bad when you, when you say that. So, you know, so, you have to look at really what's, now, if you include kids and family and mortgage, which I, I don't have any of those, I have mortgages now, but like, when you start kind of compounding stuff, it makes a difference. But when you're under 30, there's not very many bad things that can happen. And if they do, it's always called living with your parents. Like you can go back and live with your parents or get another job. So from my parents' perspective, they were like, screw it. The worst thing that can happen is goes back to school and right. I wouldn't trade the experience that I've had over the last six years for any school. Um, I ask so. that because I think sometimes, for some people that seems like the most extreme you know, move, but for you, it made yeah. perfect sense with what you, where yeah. you were at, your personality, and what you wanted to do. So, now what was interesting is my um, partner, his parents were not as um, accepting, I would say. They're great people, obviously, and I'm still friends with them. Uh, they were not accepting, they were more on the like, you have to graduate school to become successful and have a good job. You know, and a lot of people are on that track because maybe their parents haven't gone to college and that's the way to get out of, you know, poverty or whatever. My friend was not in poverty, but that was just, that was their mentality. You know, and a lot of people have that. And I still get some people from Houston, parents that I knew back when I was at University of Houston, they email me and they're like, Derek, congrats on the 25 under 25 entrepreneurs. 
But if you thought about going back to school, because you're not going to be successful until you go and graduate college. And I'm just like, oh my God, like they have no clue right now. Um, but yeah, they were not as accepting. And if your family and your friends and your support circle is against what you're doing, it makes it 10 times harder. Um, I, I bought, uh, or the company actually bought uh, Matt, the original founder out of the company within the first six months or so. I would say the majority of the reason was because every day he would come to work and there would be that kind of nagging in the back of his friends, his family, his college people saying, what the hell are you doing? Like this doesn't make sense. And if somebody's saying that to you all the time and you're trying to do something that's crazy, it just won't you start work. believing it. Yeah. 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 And it's funny, so my parents are completely supportive. They're always like, awesome. You're working, keep working more, keep doing, you know, keeping it up. So there's no way kind of in my life that's like, are you really making the right decision? Cause if there would, then I would start thinking that way. Right. Well, Derek, I appreciate your time. This has been awesome. And I hope everyone got as much out of it as I did. Hey, hey, it's great uh, talking to you and hopefully we can talk soon. Yep.